they said they well, we shut the door and let them go. Tell them to tell the other people to come around the back. Yeah, we shouldn't. People who are on time shouldn't be penalized. Yeah, I think. That's right. <laughs> Okay, if I could have everyone's attention, I'd like to welcome everybody here for actually what's the uh, first David Adler Memorial Lecture. Um, I want to say a few words about Dave Adler before we go on. Um, many people here do know Dave Adler, but probably many people or more people don't know Dave Adler. Uh, Dave Adler was an exceptional physicist. He was a humanist, a person, someone you like calling your friend. He was comfortable working with everyone, from graduate students to secretaries to uh, undergraduates to his colleagues at MIT. And everyone enjoyed working with him. He was encyclopedic in his knowledge of materials and condensed matter physics. He and Stan developed a very special relationship. Working with Stan together, they developed and amplified many concepts in amorphous materials. This was a perfect relationship where they went from ideas to concepts, to papers, back to ideas, and back to concepts. It was just a wonderful relationship. I enjoyed watching the two of them work. Dave Atla unfortunately died a few days before his 53rd birthday. His father hadn't lived till 53. His grandfather hadn't lived till 53. It was just genetic in the family. Uh, we're all very saddened by the fact that he died suddenly, but we left us behind with tremendous memories and friendship. Uh, he died right after the March 1987 meeting in New York City of the announcement of high temperature superconductivity. And I remember working with him on many aspects of the press with respect to high temperature superconductors. Sad that he died at 53, but the good point about it is that Dave lived his life twice as full as most people. Dave produced twice as much quality material as most people, and Dave's work will uh, be last twice as long as anyone else's. So although he died at 53, he really lived 106 years, twice 53. <laughs> but we would have preferred he lived to 212, which would have been 106. Um, now I would like to introduce Stan, who of course doesn't need an introduction to this audience, but I got to know Stan through uh, my relationship with Dave Adler, my interest and in Stan's interest in superconductivity. And I worked in this building very much with uh, Gazelay and others um, in the Institute for Morphous Materials in which we did a lot of debates and conferences like this. And in fact, there are eight books published by Plenum Press on the Institute of Amorphous Materials Press, which is a real achievement of this institute. Um, Stan is one of those exceptional inventors whose ideas are almost always ahead of his time. And we always have to wait for the world to catch up. And the world does catch up, finally, and really does understand what Dave is up to, what Stan is up to. Stan runs an exceptional company. It's always my pleasure to come here. Quality people, great loyalty, great loyalty to ECD and its mission. I think this atmosphere is a direct result of Stan's philosophy, his business concepts, and his wonderful relationship with Iris. I mean, it really just shows. Um, recently, I want to tell a little story. When Stan was, uh, when I was here about six months ago, Stan noticed my tie. I don't know if people noticed the tie, but it's a periodic table tie. And so he said to me, he has such a tie, but it's in white and doesn't go well with his suit. Now, he asked me where I had bought the tie, and I had actually bought it at a street fair in New York City. This is off the street. I don't know what it was doing there, but when I walked by a periodic table tie, I bought it immediately. So now I had to go trace down. And in the world of the internet and others and friends, it didn't take me long to trace down a tie, and I knew it was Stan's birthday, and I sent it to him. But I knew Stan just doesn't accept the gift, because it was not meant really as a gift in that sense. And I thought, like, what does this tie mean to Stan, and how will he use it? And it really came to me that I really developed a, a philosophy and tried to really read into Stan's mind. And what it came to is basically, Stan is the man who communicates with the elements. And that's really the true fact. I mean, he and the elements have a very special relationship. So that's what Stan has been doing his whole career. I'm honored to introduce him. I'm very happy to have him speak to all of us. And I hope he's going to tell us what the elements are telling him today. <laughs> let me, let me, 
Let me just say the title of this talk is Fundamentals and Implications of Amorphous and Disordered Materials. It's a, uh, to say it's a great honor to be here, especially in front of an audience such as this, who people, my colleagues and collaborators who have really made this field possible, uh, I, I, I just am very humble about that. And to show you that it, that is in words, we've had this institute for many years, and this is the first time since the foundation. When, when did we found it? about 84, that I've given a talk in the Institute. I never set it up to be a personal, uh, to be something that represented me personally, but represented the, what I consider to be the noblest ideas in science. I spoke at one international meeting that was held here under the auspices of the American Physical Society. Other than that, this is my, my first talk at the Institute. And I, I put off, trying to honor David because uh, the way we honor David is working every day at our work. He was a very, everybody remembers him as such a fun-loving person, and he was, but what he really was was an extremely serious and deep scientist who was very open and became, with, uh, with Helmut Fritschy, who is sitting up front here, my closest collaborator. Uh, Helmut and Dave, in fact, with Mark Kastner, wrote one of the seminal papers in our field. And I think that one can say about Dave that if we, if we wanted to divide up disciplines and, and say theoretical physics, that as a theoretical physicist in our field, he was, uh, he was the best. And we met together in the same year that uh, Helmut uh, had arranged for a meeting with Sir Neville Mott and both Sir Neville Mott, Neville Mott, who has been here many times and who won the Nobel Prize in our field, and Dave had one thing in common when we met that year, that they were both out of sorts. They were both, they had been both part of an excitement of science and then didn't feel that, that their part of the science was that, was that exciting that could move them. And both of them joined with us uh, with, with great reward to us. Now, I won't go into what David is to us except to say that he, that he was an unusual and exceptional person. So I'm not going to make it as if it's his obituary because he does, one of the reasons that we took so long, it, it was very painful to, to think that we're honoring him by, by, in death. And uh, we talk about him all the time. He continues to be part of us. He was a brilliant polymath. His knowledge of understanding, as Ryan mentioned, is outstanding. What people don't know is he started his uh, doctorate at Harvard with Schwinger. Professor Schwinger was uh, the one of the founders of quantum electrodynamics and won a Nobel Prize uh, in the field and was uh, a, math a mathematical physicist. In fact, he was, he was so superb that it's difficult to explain. But one of the things that he was most famous for in the physics world were all the stories about him. He didn't like students. He didn't want to be near them. And so he arranged his time schedule to always do work at night or call meetings when the uh, students couldn't get up. And, and then he'd drive up in his big car in the morning and his poor students, and Dave was serving with a man getting his doctorate with a man who was more than world famous. He was an icon in the field. And he had total lack of access. People used to follow Schwinger into the Johns just to be able to try to find time to talk to him. It wasn't very successful, by the way. Uh, so David is a very free spirit, was a very free spirit. And he turned to solid state physics because he said, that isn't for me. That's not my idea of science. I'm very honored to be working with Schwinger, actually. He's a New Yorker like I am. You know, New Yorkers among the physicists are a special breed, I believe. And uh, so he decided he would turn uh, to a, choose a, to a, he chose a well-worn path, he thought, of crystals. Wanted to get away from the crystal structure, really, of silicon. He felt a lot of people were studying that. 
And so for his PhD thesis, actually, he, he picked transition metal oxides. And as you'll hear today, transition metals have to de do with uh, d orbital elements. And that's an old-fashioned periodic table. Usually they're out there so that you can just see them in line, but th that's fine. Now, he decided to, and it, it defied logic why he would do that, because mathematical physics is, is incapable of really dealing with some of the very uh, complex uh, Fermi-level uh, calculations that have to go with these materials. And they, uh, and they defied logic by being dielectrics. Oxides are usually dielectrics. And some of these oxides were conductors, and he found that to be interesting. Now, I had, in the 50s, devised my first amorphous switch based on transition metal oxides, and obviously had a very great interest in DNF orbitals. And uh, in 1967, I read several preprints of his, which mutual friends had arranged to, for me to get. And so I, we also arranged to meet David at the Physical Society meeting in San Francisco in 1967. David at that time was 32 years old, and um, he immediately became a fascinated, just like Mott did, uh, with amorphous and disordered materials. And we worked together in true, great, friendly, and, and really wonderful harmony from that point on. Here was a person who I would have thought was a mathematical physicist, and he would not, and he just took to this field, and it, in, he, he made very important contributions, and I would say, in fact, I think that either Helmut or, or uh, who is the world's greatest experimental as well as a theoretical physicist uh, who helped create this field, uh, would, and Kastner said that, that they felt, and I feel that way, and I hope I'm not speaking out of school, that uh, he was not a synthesizer like Mott. He truly was our greatest uh, spirit in the field of amorphous materials. So what I'd like to do is to uh, show a f my first overhead because it's go there's going to be a running theme. I was very frightened to give this talk uh, because I'm dealing with, uh, I, I want to make it comprehensive, uh, con comprehensive to scientists, con comprehensible to, to non-scientists. And so I decided I must distill, I must distill everything down to a, their fundamentals. To speak of this field is to give you some historical perspective, uh, philosoph philo philosophical perspective, but real science that, that distinguishes the field of amorphous and disordered material. There was Dave, you won't, and I'm not asking you to read the inscription, but he said to Stan, who showed me how to think. And I, and I wanted to explain what he meant by that, because obviously David was a, a, a great thinker. And I, the reason for this is that entire semiconducting field in solid state physics, in fact, was based upon study of crystal structures, periodicity, one atom being like another atom in, in, in a periodic role, and predictable, even though there are many atoms, you could apply mathematics uh, to such a material, and you could then uh, you, could, you could then do some beautiful work with it. And this field really started by great men like Dirac and others back in the late 20s. And I won't go into the history, but there was some very deep physics involved with it. But yet it sort of, it was constrained by what I call the, the tyranny of the crystalline lattice. Because everybody was working with very constrained materials of, and that you could apply mathematics. And here I came along and said uh, that, well, I'm afraid we're working in a field where you can't apply mathematics yet. And those of you who, who teach school know that uh, mathematics is called the queen of science. And it is the basis. It's absolutely known that you cannot do physics without, uh, without uh, mathematics. How could there be physics without periodicity? And this was the great debate and why uh, there was controversy in the early days. In fact, uh, Zyman, who was a famous physicist from Oxford, one of the most famous, declared that amorphous and disordered materials were impossible uh, to be semiconductors. They, were, uh, they, they, weren't, they, 
go away. They weren't right. They couldn't be used. They had no science to them. In fact, he couldn't understand why, what it was about or why anybody was interested. By the way, years later, he joined the fold and made and wrote books about it, about, uh, about it. Uh, so uh, I would like to, uh, to say the first part of my talk will be what was needed. Now there's a very, very well-known historian of science called Kuhn, who you all know as the originator of this shift of paradigm, which is everything that people talk about has become hackneyed. I won't read it for you. I think you can see that what it says that a, a, new, a new theory, a new part of science when it comes is rejected and that, that it has to somehow transform the imagination and ultimately describe the transformation in which scientific work is done. And they always are accompanied, the defining characteristics are scientific revolutions, but then they take over from the older fields. So you have, there's this, there is this battle between established ideas and the emergence of new ideas. And I say that because I don't want you to take my view of this, but if periodicity uh, needs mathematics, and indeed that's the, ba the, the basis of the band theory of solids, which should have been called the band theory of crystals, then disordered materials means uncertainty. And all physicists knew about uncertainty was that Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, and this had very little to do with it. So when one uses many, many elements, there is a, an uncertainty automatically that becomes part of the relationship of one atom to another, and that makes it mathematically uh, untenable. In physics, there appears to be no way of making a science out of what is called many-bodied uh, theory. If anyone knows that there's been a true science of this, please tell me afterwards or, or argue a afterwards. Many-body theory is a basic part of science. Actually, very few people work in it because they find it impossible. You cannot solve many-bodied particle theory uh, in mathematically. You just can't. It's, it's, it seems to be an impossibility. So now I'd like to say, well, then how do you approach this problem of where you now have a disordered material, where you have many elements, which is many-bodied in a way, and which you put together in three-dimensional space in new and unusual ways that nature never intended and get new and unusual and, in fact, unique uh, phenomena. Is there, is there such a way? And so I'd like to take you down the path of what I've used to look for solace. And Iris and I went through some of our old quotes, and uh, we, picked, uh, we picked a couple to show that truly we're still part of the great tradition of science. In fact, uh, you can do uh, the, the uh, original physics without mathematics, and there's a basic scientific principle that comes to, uh, to, uh, to a view. And that's, uh, well, here's, a, we're, we're, that's okay. This is, this is the Einstein room, and uh, a theory is the more impressive, the greater the simplicity of its premises is, and the more different kinds of things that it can relate to, and the more extended in it is its area of applicability. So we want to come down to fundamentals. That's why the, the, or, uh, the origination of, the, uh, of the, uh, like the talk. This is the one that I really want to point out. Point Carré said, it is by logic, that, and by the way, he was a great physicist. He said, it is by logic that we prove, but by intuition that we discover. So if you're in a new field, and if you're in a field that you have no guidelines for, then you must have, and you have, the jewel tool of physicists, which is intuition. And let me go on for quickly to a couple more, so as you don't think that uh, I'm, I just picked these at random. Uh, Einstein said, my power, my particular ability lies in visualizing the effects. Remember the term visualizing. Consequences and possibilities. I grasp things in a broad way easily. I cannot do mathematical calculations easily. I do not do them willingly and not readily. Now that's a hell of a statement for the man who, whose general relativity is still, is still so deep mathematically 
that people are finding more and more and more uh, excitement in it. But he really meant it. He, he, he was a visualizer. That's, that's how he, he thought about the speed of light. He pretended as a kid, what would happen if I rode along with a beam of light? He, he visualized. So now we have to be able to visualize atoms. We have to, and that's why I thank Brian for that. You have to be able to see them, and you have to be able to talk to them and listen to what they have to say. And so I'd like to go quickly then. This fellow is the Astronomer General. Royal, uh, Royal I'm sorry. I, I'm in England now, so I must say <laughs> Royal uh, 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 in England. And he says there are two kinds of physicists. Now we're those who hit upon relevant equations will therefore think about the equations rather than about the physical phenomenon itself. Others are more at ease, well, well, at ease well, with pictorial or geometrical, you didn't do it, pictorial or ge geometrical concepts. So when you look around here, you'll see pictorial and geometrical concepts. And I, I, I felt that Feynman didn't like to be thought of as an authority uh, because he actually re, uh, resigned, one of the very few people who resigned from the National Academy of Science. He didn't want to be with the establishment and with authority. So well, I think we can use him. Feynman said, the physicist needs a facility in looking at problems from several points of view. Physical understanding is a completely unmathematical, imprecise, and inexact thing but absolutely necessary for a physicist. So first comes the intuition, and then comes the mathematics. And I think that I'm almost at the end of my quotes. I think I've now called upon enough authority so that you will listen to me to say that no, we're not trying to wave our hands. No, we're not trying to do, uh, do, do physics in, in a vacuum. What we're, what we're trying to do, what we're trying to do really is to find out what's new about nature that it's been hiding from us. Uh, our great friend Robbie, I, I Robbie, used to say, when you, when you wrestle with God, you better have a long grasp. So uh, I, think that, uh, I think that visualization, uh, I think that uh, not being afraid to leave, uh, to leave uh, the shore. What I, and I'll draw one picture here. I usually draw. I, I, I'm very bad at anything with drawing pictures in my own quiet. But let me tell you why, what David had to learn and how he learned it. And I'll use history now and, and pretend this is a shoreline. That's a shoreline. The early explorers didn't have the modern tools of science. So when they explored, what did they do? They followed the shoreline so the, as closely as possible. And when you do that, what you, you find interesting things, some new cultures, people may have just a little bit different color, but you don't really find anything truly dramatic. And where does the exploration really go to? What discovers the new continents? What opens up the new worlds? The one who's able to, to go out in the ocean and to go in the uncharted sea and that's where the new discoveries are. They're not just a repetition of, of what we know. And in the old days, in the, in the medieval days, the, when the earth was considered to be flat, uh, they, there was always, and I won't draw the dragon, but the, they always told the, the adventuresome souls, like mothers tell their children, don't go out there, because out here is where the dragons lie. You'll find that in some of the history of science books. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to go out there and we're going to slay the dragons, but more importantly, we're going to find the new areas of science that can affect our world and our society. And when Iris and I got together, we decided to start energy conversion devices in the first of January, 1960, on the basis that whatever we did in science and technology, and I'd been doing it, I'd been in the morphous field for some years, it wasn't a field then, would have to be exciting, would have to be rewarding for us in the fact that we were using science and technology to solve societal problems. So the, I'm going to, when I get to the use of the atoms, I'm going to show you how the most exciting, the most exciting physics can lead to very prosaic things that 
the next century will take for granted. Now, was there any work when I started in 1955, was there any work going on in the area? No, it wasn't really a field. Uh, there was uh, some work that was starting in Russia, that, and they measured uh, materials, and they found that they're intrinsic with temperature, amorphous materials. Uh, there's hundreds of them, I suppose, helmet, uh, uh, materials like that. So since there was nothing new in that, and since there was nothing that suggested profound things, it never really got off the bat. And when Sergei joined the field um, years later, he, he uh, was able to make his contributions there. Uh, so there was nothing really happening there. Uh, the only thing else, so Iris and I thought, well, gee, you know, we hate to be all alone. And I know that, uh, that uh, Xerox, which was just not really started, uh, not really being well accepted at that point yet, they, they really are working with amorphous drums. So that's amorphous, that's disorder, that has some use. Why don't we go to visit, and we had some good friends, why don't we go to visit uh, uh, Xerox, and that time it was in Rochester, uh, in, uh, New York. And we went and they treated us wonderfully. And it was just nice. But every laboratory they took me, they only showed me crystalline selenium. And so at the end of that, they said, well, well do you have any questions, Stan? I says, where's your amorphous work? I mean, that's what you have, a drum that works. We don't understand that, they said. So since we don't understand it, what we're going to do is we're going to find out all we can about crystalline selenium, and that'll teach us then about amorphicity. And so what, what they were doing was following this shoreline. There was absolutely no work when we went there in amorphous materials by Xerox. And in fact, some of the very important work that was done in xerography was done in this very room by, by Steve Hudgens, uh, Joe uh, uh, Dollar, Bud, uh, Flight Bud fame, and, and others. And uh, w at one time, Steve, uh, how many uh, patents were there in terms of the uh, of silicon drums uh, by, by uh, Xerox? None. How many did we have? I, I, don't, I, I, don't mean, I don't mean to belabor the point. All I mean to say is that they were, they were hugging the shore. And they weren't finding anything. That's like looking for the nickel uh, you know, under the lamppost instead of where you, where you lost it. So you can understand when I reported that there was very exciting switching and memory and uh, control effects, sensor effects in amorphous materials, it was not welcome. In fact, they used to use the word schmutz uh, which means, uh, how, how can you take these elements, dirt, dirt material, dirt material uh, take these elements, make things with them, and there, there can't be anything to it. So what I, what Dave and I, when we, uh, with, when Helmut uh, helped organize this institute, and Dave did as well, uh, Dave said, let's try our hand at writing an introduction to the institute about the work. And that's now, I, I want to tell you, how he, his mind was open, how despite his background, his personality was just wide open so that you could discuss and, and it was just a great, great pleasure. And so he had, uh, uh, he wrote in the uh, brochure the, uh, that he emphasized he wanted to get acceptance. He even wrote an article for the MIT Journal. So he wanted to get acceptance by saying, look, amorphous isn't that different than crystalline materials. It just has some bond angle uh, changes and so on. But really, it's, it's the same. Don't be frightened. Don't be frightened of it. And so he, and he wrote in his draft that, that. Uh, and uh, then in the next overhead. Uh, so, you yeah, I, yeah. Well, we, I thought it might be an argument, but it wasn't. That was, I want to say, about David. I said, David, that's not what we're about. So I appreciate that, but what we're about is however it is the ability to synthesize myriad new materials with new and unique physical, chemical, and electronic pro uh, properties, which make amorphous materials so exciting. And that, in fact, m many of the materials, uh, and I, actually the most that are interesting, depends on the fact that many do not have corresponding crystal structure. In other words, they do not have a, uh, you cannot say, I've learned this from a crystal, I can now apply it to amorphous. The interesting materials, where you do many elements at once, has, has not 
an equivalent crystalline structure. So now we, that's when Dave thought about it and he moved away from the shoreline and, he's, and he, he went out there. Now that's a brave thing to do because when you do that, like Helmut can tell you, and Helmut is, is, a, is a historic and marvelous figure in, in, in our field and, and truly a great collaborator. His, his con contributions are, are immense. What, what Helmut will tell you that it took courage to be able to stand up against, you never think of scientists as mobs, but that's really what it, what it was like, really what it was like. Now, so what then is the unifying physical principle that we can use? I try to get this down to its simplest form. Disorder. I know that those of you who are of the 60s will remember that uh, disorder meant what happened in Berkeley. Amorphous was what Hemingway wrote about that was, it was structureless. And here we were using words like amorphous and disorder. Now what does disorder mean? It is not a negative term. Amorphous is not a negative term. When you have disorder, you now have the freedom to design atomically local order and local environments and create new and total new environments. Artists would be very happy in that kind of a media. So we lift the restrictions of the crystal structure. We allow many new, I mean, we could make any material you want. I would only want to say hundreds. I can say thousands. I mean, you're not restricted. You, you just go to there and if you know the, uh, how to use it, you can put together uh, literally tremendous amount of materials, which as I will show you, have tremendous impact in how we're going to live and our children are going to live. And we open new degrees of freedom, and, if, and not only for semiconductors, for metals, for catalysts, for many other things, and new electronic, chemical, and physical phenomena results. These are used to solve major problems in the field. And that is the information and processing, new synthetic materials, and clean energy. That's what we, well, there's nothing bigger than energy. There's nothing bigger than, than there's nothing bigger than the information side of the business. And we all live in the world of materials. That's how you define civilizations, the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, the, you know, and so on. So we'll go on now. I wanted to tell you why disorder is a scientific term. It is a scientific term. Uh, I would like to talk now about the atoms and their orbitals. And I've picked, I've picked uh, for uh, the interesting ones, the ones that would, uh, the ones that would by themselves give you disorder and opportunity for engineering of materials. I'll leave out, I'll leave out uh, carbon and boron for one reason only. Boron and carbon, carbon makes for life, they both have, have different ways of bonding, so they automatically give you disorder in a material as you use them. And that's very good, and in fact, boron is used as a glass former, because before we entered the field, that was, Iris and I went to so many meetings, we gave it up. We, go to, we thought amorphous, well, that means people think it's glassy. Well, that's how they put it in the dictionary, and they put it in other places. So we went to these meetings, and the only thing that was spoken at the meeting was, was what is glass? And now glass has been around for thousands of years. In fact, Helmut spoke about it a couple of years ago at the Institute, and it's beautiful. And they still didn't understand what is glass, but to them it was a passive receptacle, something you look through or you, uh, you made ornaments from. It is disordered, by the way. So I want to leave out glass formers as such, and to tell you that other things that give you optional bonding and give you new environments are the P orbitals and the D orbitals. Now I'll start with the S orbital because it's, it's very symmetrical and you think it's uninteresting, it obviously is very important, but for our purposes we only care about it as it interacts with the D and, and P orbitals. So that you can see it. Now we, 
Now, now we go to, uh, uh, we went there, and now, now, now we go to the d-orbital materials. D-orbital materials are the transition metals, uh, you know, like titanium, vanadium, chromium, manganese, and uh, so on. And then there's rare earths, which I'll talk about, which are f-orbitals. And that's, and that's was the way I, as I said, I wanted to meet with, the, with David to find out if anybody knew much about these things. Now look at that. Those are directional. And in fact, if I were to make a material right in front of your eyes, I could do it nobody's looking. Uh, you know, I, I could do it like this. You can see right away, you can see right away that you're getting interactions of orbitals that you won't ever get, that you don't know, it's brand new. So what would you do with the orbitals? And that's, that's what we're going to talk about. But you can see that. Now I mentioned F orbitals and I should, uh, did somebody steal them? No, here's one. Uh, F orbitals also have a lot of interaction. The only problem is they're so close to the nucleus of the atom that they're not very uh, accessible to you. D orbitals can be very accessible. And keep in mind that they're directional and you can mix them up and you can get a large amount of density of states. I just have to mention this kind of physics to you. In physics, we uh, think of a band gap, and we think of a band gap with states in the band, in the gap. There's a, we, Moral Cohn, Helmut, and I uh, came up with a model that, that got a lot of following called the cohn fritjofsky model. Where we, sh where we talked about a mobility gap. And I'm not going to go into that with you, except to say that there was distributed in the band gap many uh, states in the gap. So for the time being, that will suffice. In when, and then you say, OK, that was a semiconductor. Now, what do you do in metals? What do you do in other materials? Well, the I, and since you want to, I want to make a battery, say, I want to store hydrogen, what would I do? Well, I, first of all, I like, I like metals. I like complex metals that are d orbitals because if I move them around and put them together in an in a electrode, then I'm putting not density of states in the semiconductor word, but just change the word density of, of sites, of active sites. And therefore, you are engineering, autom you're, are engineering elements so that they have a, a, at the Fermi level, I won't go beyond the Fermi level right now, you, you have a very high density of sites because of the, of the uh, interaction of all these d orbitals. Now, why is that important? Well, you hear a lot about the hydrogen economy. The hydrogen economy is going to take over. We're all going to live in hydrogen. And, and it, it's very, uh, when you drive our car or our scooter, you're in the hydrogen economy already. Instead of talking about it or waving our hand, it's, it's composed, it's working <coughs> element is hydrogen. What's interesting about hydrogen? Now let me go to cosmology for a moment. 85% of the material aspect of the universe is made up of hydrogen. 85% of the universe. The first real hydride was uh, after the Big Bang, and, and hydrogen was the first thing that came out of it, some helium and uh, a little bit of lithium. And the rest of it was cooked up in the stars by the burning of hydrogen, all the other elements. So if you look here, the first thing you'll notice is that there's nothing else above it. And there's nothing else to the left of it. And, and it is the smallest element, and it is the lightest element, and if we could fill up electrodes with hydrogen, if we could fill up electrodes with hydrogen and take them out at will, then we would have the, the, the ultimate in energy storage. And now, why would that be interesting? So let's, take, let's think about hydrogen for a moment. Uh, the the, the uh, hydrogen without, uh, atom without its electron becomes the proton. Now there was in one of the books, it very poetically said, a thimbleful of protons is more protons than there are stars in the, in the Milky Way. So if you ask, if you ask me, and I, I would like you to, I like you to 
think about it because we're going to be talking about transportation in a moment. And the father of the electric vehicle, the person responsible for this great transition, is the, f the finest engineer, the best colleague, and really one of the greatest people that I've ever had the opportunity to meet with, and that's Bob Stemple. And, and Bob, Mr. Stemple came out to see us because he had a beautiful car, but he didn't have a battery. And if you want an electric car, you have to have a battery. Now why then, uh, if I'd have talked to him about hydrogen, it would have been meaningless. We had to show him how you could s simplify, how you could have simple models, and simple ways of putting things together so that you could take it, and he took it, you can handle it, and you could understand it, and you could make th things go like you've read about. We've gone so far, the uh, record is 373 miles on a single charge, well, that's pretty good. That's only the beginning. Why is it only the beginning? Because we have many more sites that we can engineer here to put more, more and more hydrogen. So unlike other batteries, other elements which depend upon, which depend upon uh, a couple of, like nickel iron or nickel cadmium or lead acid or lithium ion, what you have here is the ability to engineer an energy storage to be whatever you want it to be depending upon your knowledge of the materials. So in the future, if you wanted to go five or 600 miles in a single charge, it will be entirely possible with these materials, but neither Bob nor I would want to do that because we'd want to make it so cheap that we'd rather have less batteries. And by the way, if you, you I hate to put him on the spot, but if you ask him, and he's the best automotive engineer anywhere at any time, he'll tell you that really an electric vehicle should be cheaper, in, in essence, should be cheaper in volume production than a gas engine vehicle. So here I am talking about hydrogen, and I'm talking, and why? Because you aren't going to invent another element. I can tell you that when you want to invent elements, you better get down here, and they're, they're, they're very, <laughs> They're very, they're very fleeting. They're very fleeting. So that's, that's, what, this, that's what our universe is made of. That's where the, uh, that's where the protons uh, came from. That's where the protons seized their electrons and, and became an atom. And that's what all of our elements there are all formed out of protons, how you put the protons together. So I just wanted, when I said I'm going to talk about fundamentals, I've got to tell you, there is no more fundamental, uh, no more fundamental energy storage source, and it's based upon these d orbital elements and using them in such a way that you expose new, new uh, sites so that uh, the hydrogen can go in and come out. Yeah, do you want to more? Uh, yeah, I like to uh, just go quickly into the other. I really am trying to hurry, but I, uh, and I, I try to think of making a talk on something that would take about a week of talks to really cover. So that's what I struggled over. Bob would come over and say, well, how are you doing? And I'd say, gee, I'm trying to, trying to shorten it. I've got four hours now, and I've got to get it down and listen to <laughs> Now, d orbitals have a certain orientation in space. That's what I've been saying. And because of neighboring atoms or ions or molecules, they change the energy of the orbitals as they're directed in space. And therefore, you get a variety of electronic configurations uh, depending upon the environment. So now you have a total environment that can control the, what happens with the element. Uh, now, yeah, I, I'm going to be coming to this later, but because it is so organically connected, the other materials that we're going to talk about in the information end of it, uh, side of it, are based upon p orbitals, except for silicon, are based upon p orbitals. And uh, Krishna was so nice. She worked in the early days with me on these models and was one of the founders of, the, of our battery work. Where, Krishna? Ah. Yeah. And so she just painted these 
uh, the, uh, the atoms sort of came apart, and just today she replaced them for me. <laughs> so, uh, and when you see, while there's a difference about things like that you're not really interested in the Fermi level, uh, what, you, what you'll see is that there are tremendous, there are tremendous similarities to the d orbitals in that they are directional. That if you mix them up, you're going to get a lot of different de density of states. Uh, now, I'm just going to go over this quickly because when we get the information, I'll, I'll try to be short. But it's not just that the orbitals are directed. But there's a peculiarity with the p orbitals of tellurium or selenium, the group six here. This is a group six. And when you see, uh, when you see uh, selenium and tellurium, they, they actually look, tellurium and selenium look a little like DNA, in fact. <laughs> that was one of our reasons for choosing them. And and they have lone pairs. What, do, what does lone pairs mean? Lone pairs mean that they have non-bonding electrons to the atom, that there are bonding uh, p orbitals that are, that are re, uh, responsible for the cohesion and the structural integrity of the material. Then there are these two electrons out here, one spin up, one spin down, and that has a history all of its own because at the end of my talk, I'm going to tell you what I think that that could mean for the future. But you can see, again, you have many directions and many sites and many uh, density of states available to you. Now, I, you can recognize Bob, and, and it's truly, well, we can say, his car. But there's going to be, uh, I, should I do it like, uh, like uh, Lee Iacocca does? You've heard it from me. There's, go there's going to be an electric vehicle industry, and there's going to be electrical vehicles in all your cars. I wish we had the opportunity to show you the, the uh, GM, and those who want it will, will furnish it to you, the GM press conference, where Iris and Bob and I were there, and Jack Smith and all the other uh, important people at General Motors outlined that they were going to use our battery, the GMOVONIC battery, which is a joint venture between us and General Motors in not only their electric vehicles, but all their hybrids and in their fuel cells. Because just think about it, the fuel cell needs batteries. So this is a beautiful car. We couldn't get one to put in front here, uh, but you'll be driving them. We have now a son in California who is driving this every day. Now, the reason I'm, I'm going between science is because when you look at this, this is abstract. And some of you would prefer to do mathematics instead of visualizing. And there's nothing wrong with that. Mathematics is still the queen of the sciences. We're not usurping it at all. But, but here, and, and Bob was somewhere over there at Iris, but the photographer, got, this was in the IEEE Journal, there, there is uh, James Warden, a young man who is doing a great job. He's originally from MIT with a small dedicated group who had a car that had four passenger car that w went between Boston and New York on a single charge and still had 15% left over. In fact, Bob uh, dr I drove it away to go to a meeting afterwards, which means, when, to think of it, why oil companies are not happy with us. But it also means that it's a selectric select car. And it also means that while they're not happy with us, in the future, we have to make sure that they don't drop bombs and have wars over oil because there is no, scientifically and technologically, there's no real reason anymore for that sort of thing. Generals always fight the last wars. And that car, that car went the equivalent of less than one gallon of gas of energy between Boston and New York. Now, that, that has to be meaningful. To, to people uh, beside oil companies. So I, like, I, I showed you that, the Selectria, uh, for you to consider, and there's one outside here, for you to consider um, what the impact on your own future and your children's future when you can do away with pollution, minimize pollution, minimize the climatic changes that, that take place. It isn't all El Nino, by the way. 
Any scientist will tell you that climatic changes have these oscillatory kind of behaviors. So El Nino is a bias to it, not the, uh, the cause of it. So we do something about pollution. We do something about the dependence of oil, which is so strategically dangerous. We do something about climate change. And then we do something very important, because we're from Detroit. And we, there's got to be jobs. There has to be to have an urban uh, life. There has to be jobs. There has to be a way of educating young people so that they have jobs of value. And so we have to build new industries. And what we're showing you now from these little models are what has brought to birth already several new industries. In fact, Iris and I used to go around and people say, uh, what are you trying to do? We said, we're trying to change the world. We don't say that anymore. The world, we've changed the world. It's not going to go back again. As one of the executives of an automotive company said, we, we can't turn back. Well, that's. So now we come back to the science. Disorder promotes a distribution of orbital directions, as I try to show you here. And previously inactive hydrogen sites are available for hydrogen storage because hydrogen binding, binding in hydrides is based on the overlap of hydrogen with empty orbitals. That's, that's the, the key for the battery. And then we, uh, then we speak about the fact that we are uh, multi-elemental, more active sites, engineered materials or design materials, and we stabilize and get new things in valences, which is important for metallurgy. Now, Helmut, I have to thank you for this. I, if you like it, you thank him. If you don't like it, blame me. Because we tried to, I, I said, I've got to get it down to fundamentals where if all the electrochemists in the audience would forgive us, electrochemistry, you spend 10 minutes explaining what the formulas mean, and you lose the meaning of what you're trying to do. And that isn't, that isn't uh, what I want to say because I would be doing an injustice to Ven Contagion. Where is Ven here? Uh, Ven, uh, to Venny Reitman. Both of these were great uh, uh, pioneers of our batteries who made the batteries really possible. And there are others. I'm sorry that uh, Subash uh, isn't here and, and that, uh, uh, and that uh, Mike Fachenko isn't here. Uh, both are... are important, very important uh, contributors to our company. And I, I'd have to give out more praise because the team is what's important. And there's so many people on the team here that I couldn't recognize because those of you remember, I can only remember three names. <laughs> so I, you know, I, I wouldn't want to follow, follow you up. And so we thought the best way of doing this is to say, OK, now there's hydrogen in the positive electrode and you want to get it over to the negative electrode. That's when you're charging. So it moves from the anode to the cathode. Now, in full charge means, remember, this is a metal. That's why you, you know, you have to understand when people say there's a golf cart, an electric car, you can go between 0 and 60 in 7 seconds, or even less if you try it hard. And General Motors went 300 and how many miles, Bob? An hour, uh, an hour? Uh, I mean, I, I'm sorry, 187. 187. I'm sorry. I was, I was thinking of an airplane. <laughs> uh, 187 miles an hour. That's that's pretty fast. You know what I'm thinking of. You know what I'm thinking of next, obviously. <laughs> so uh, that was a slip, but uh, seriously, uh, at th at this point, at this point, we uh, these electrons represent a conducting. Uh, electrode because it's a it's a metal, and these hydrogens start as protons, and as soon as they can uh, find uh, electrons, they they become atoms, and so you get a you get a full charge. And the electrolyte, which is where the electrochemists like it, is is there, and we we can look at it as being neutral, and I won't explain why. It's it's a, got to be a very good ionic conductor, and in it there are electrochemical reactions that do take place that provide some of the hydrogen ions. But if I put a solid electrode, uh, if I put a solid uh, ionic conductor, I could st uh, electrolyte, I could still have a battery. And I've done that. So in principle, I, we just show the electrolyte. And then here we show when we 
discharge it or use it, and that's what the light bulb goes off. The, the hydrogen comes back in here from the negative, goes back into the positive, and so you're using energy, your stored energy. So uh, uh, that's that's simple example. We can we can go on from that. Yeah. Uh, No, I'm not going to tell what I'm going to show. <laughs> I, I, I like the suspense, I, especially especially as electronics is going to is electronics going to work. This is just two I'd like to show you the next uh, slide quickly because it, uh, to show you, you have to, to store energy, energy is a system. You also have to generate energy. How can you generate ener energy? Let's go back to our old friend, yeah. Uh, there, there he is doing what I'm doing here now. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, uh, I, I think that uh, the sh uh, what we're going to be talking about briefly are the shingles that are that are make for better roofs and that generate electricity from the sun. And we use our old friend, we use old, our old friend hydrogen because in this way, the sun is composed of hydrogen burning. It's it's burning. It's a hybrid. It's burning up a lot of hydrogen, and as it burns, it gives us the light that we need and impacts on a solid state material, very thin, we'll talk about it, and you generate electricity. How then can you talk about an energy shortage in the world? There is an energy excess in the world. And what we want to do is to tell you more about that so that we show you that you can generate electricity by the sun, which is hydrogen, and you can, and by the way, those of you who like nuclear reactors, the best nuclear reactor is 93 million miles away where it's burning up its hydrogen, and much safer. And so back, that's all right. I'm not gonna spend more than a second on this one. Uh, back, back in the old days, I said, people were making wild statements about how they were gonna so solve the energy crisis from making things that big. And I said, no, 
That isn't what's going to do it. We're going to have to make it by the role. And what we're going to do, and Masa can remember this because he was making rolls of other materials. Uh, Masa Izu, who was our very early collaborator and made very important contributions. And so we're going to do this. And so uh, because the whole idea is if you generate electricity and it's going to be costly, nobody's going to use it. It's got to be, and we set for ourselves the, the goal of having electricity. We're not just playing around with science. We're very serious. The electricity has to be uh, the same price or cheaper than conventional uh, fuel. That's our goal. Just like with the batteries, that's our goal. And therefore, we not only invent the materials, we invent the products, and we invent the production machinery. And I'm very pleased to see some of our people here, especially my brother Herb, who, uh, who was one of the original designers uh, of the machine and, and, uh, and in charge of our shop to produce it. A lot of people help, but I just want to point out, uh, I just want to point out that we are, we are obligated because we're still building machines. And what I said is, is that what we have to do is to, this is a newspaper plant, Washington Post. How do they make newspaper prints? They just do it by roll to roll process. That's why newspapers are so cheap. Why can't we do the same thing in terms of thin film materials of silicon, which is, silicon is, amorphous silicon is not, is not here at the shoreline. It's about over here, about over here. It's a step away. It's, it's not in the middle of the ocean there, and it's not where the dragons fall off. But it's, there's, there is similar physics in amorphous photovoltaics that there are in crystalline, except that you have a tremendous change. You have one, less than one micron can absorb sunlight. You have to have 50 to 150 microns in, in, in the crystalline materials. And the reason for that, I won't go into it, is that a, a, the physics is different in that it is a, uh, our materials are direct band gap materials, and the crystalline th uh, materials depend on indirect band gap. So now uh, that uh, I, uh, I, I'm holding in my hand here uh, very lightweight. And you're going to see in a moment something even better than this. But this was done years ago on a production machine. Anybody who knows about s solar cells knows how expensive they are, how thick they are, how breakable they can't touch them. And this is a solar cell. And now what I'd like to do is to catch up with myself for the, for the moment. Uh, and, well, maybe now, now is just the right. Hmm? Uh, let's show the machine first. And those of you who visit the plant down there, people come from all over the world to see it, you can see that this, this is exactly what we've done. And we have a continuous web. And we make literally, I won't say by the half mile, three quarter, just as a rule of thumb, we make wide material, not little pieces, by the mile. And we'll show you how we do that in production. And there are those sitting here who make the, those machines work and who have contributed mightily to that. So this is a, a plant. It, it, it pays to see it. We're very proud. It's a work of art. It's a beauty. It's a, one of the wonders of the world as far United as we're The United Solar. I, men, I mentioned General Motors as being our partner in, in the automotive uh, production of batteries. And United Solar is a joint venture. We were working on our own for years in our own company, and we joined up with Canon, who had some more money than we did. And we uh, were able to uh, continue as a joint venture. Now, to, do you have to picture that this is less than a, a micron thick, so that it isn't this, this big. And so we have what we call a triple device, very thin films. And these triple devices do is they absorb the sunlight that you can hear from the higher frequencies, and, and then you absorb the rest of it you can hear from the lower and down to the lower frequencies. And so you are getting everything out of the sun that you can. And so uh, 
that's very important. H.G. Wells wrote a book one time, and in it he, he made a phrase that I, I never forgot. It was 1910. 1910. He wanted to snare the sun. So I think he'd be happy to see that we have snared the sun. We've used it up. Now, we have a lot, just like we have a lot more hydrogen that we can put in batteries, there's a lot of things we can do to make this even more efficient. Uh, Subendu Guha, Jeff Yang and the group have the world's, all the world's records, continued the ECD tradition where we always had the records, have all the world's records in efficiencies. Right now in small area, 13% stabilized efficiency in these things where people thought that just like it was a golf cart for batteries, this, uh, you could never get more than a couple percent efficiency. Now, go ahead. And then, and then you have, you cover roofs. The housing industry tells us that they're bigger than the automotive industry. And President Clinton, that's why you saw him there, he has this million roof program. And when you're talking about energy, you're not talking about hundreds of millions, you're not talking about billions of dollars, you're talking about trillions of dollars. Now I'm gonna come back to that. But I think at this point, uh, I'd like to have uh, Subendu come up, if he would. Subendu is the, is the uh, Chief Operating Officer, Vice Pre Executive Vice President of the company, and one of the world's great scientists, I know he's without peer in, in this field of solar energy. And I thought that he would give you an idea of another area beside this huge area of housing. He would give you an idea that there's going to be an explosive revolution, which we're going to be talking about information in other ways, of information and communications. And Iris, do you have a picture of that? Do yeah. The first uh, well, all right, we'll go through the houses quickly. There's Herb and there's a metal roof. Th these work. We're going to put one on in our own house. There's a carport. So you don't have to worry about how much uh, of the utilities energy you're, work you're using. You, take the, you steal the energy from the sun, you snatch, you snare it from the sun, and, and you charge up your batteries for your cars. Uh, yeah, well, I like to put it on there, and then Subendu can use this to talk about. And uh, it's my great pleasure to have Subendu show them. Stan just asked me to tell you briefly about what photovoltaic can do for telecommunication. As you know, that today many of the telecommunication is through links, which are either through wires or through fibers. But there is a revolution taking place where you are going to use space to facilitate telecommunication amongst various countries. It is not a new concept in that, that people have been using very high altitude satellites today. But what is happening is that there are two things that are happening. One is that one is planning to have a constellation of satellites, hundreds or thousands of those satellites to have instantaneous access to communication. And what they want is very lightweight photovoltaic. The other approach that you see here is that you can also have communication through giant football-sized spaceships stationary above the major cities. And both these things need very lightweight photovoltaic. And we are following two approaches. One is that Stan showed you this machine that we have where we use this five mil thick stainless steel, but you can make it much thinner. And this is something which is on half a mil thick. And this can produce up to 300 watts per kilogram. This is already one order higher than what you can get today. But if you want to take it to the extreme, the picture that Stan showed you this particular one, but you can take it to the final extreme where you can make it on a thin cap tone, which is one mil. So I give you a number. The conventional technology is about 30 watts per kilogram. This can give you about 300 watts per kilogram. But this can give you about 1,500 watts per kilogram. And this is what we are doing. And what you can do, in addition, is that I told you that you can have the giant spaceships about the cities. And these are huge, humongous-sized balloons. And you can use that as a theme of the balloon. So this is something which Dan says that, you know, going all the way. And <laughs> this is, if you talk about something which is totally unknown, this is something. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Now, 
I want, I want to do, uh, from all of this, I hope you also get the idea that science is done by people. And there, if there's going to be an electric vehicle industry, and there is going to be, then you're looking at the man who's making it happen, Bob Stemple. And all of us, all of us are changing the world. All of us are doing the things necessary to make this happen. And I wanted to uh, go into the information. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you think I should save it or is yes. you? Okay. No. no, I think we'll do it now. Okay. Uh, Iris allows me to take this picture in my wallet. The only other picture is of a woman is her own. <laughs> um, and this, this is, this is, brings chills to me. This is in Mexico. An, an, an Indian young lady her, in her teens carrying the future in front of her and the future on her back. Those are photovoltaic panels climbing a mountain barefooted, barefooted to bring electricity to her village. Without energy, there is no civilization. So we are very proud that not only are we entering the communication age and making uh, that possible, we're entering the automotive and all the others. There's 500 million of our small batteries made every year, this last year. But we are, we are making for a better world and a better life for people by giving distributed energy where there was never there before. And now I'd like to get to the information side of the business. And, uh, and I know that I must hurry on this, but uh, we will I'll let, Iris refuses to give the talks. She put, she's exploiting me. So you find, she'll find me where I'm at. Uh, <laughs> what, I, what, I like to, what I like to do is I have this coin. Some of you also have this coin. Back how many years ago, Iris, did we? Uh, let's see, 81. Yeah, when we were 21 years old. <laughs> yeah. And what we, what we had, what we had was information on the one side of the coin and energy on the other side of the coin. Because all information is, is structured energy. You can't have, you can't have information. And they're, they're synonymous. And so uh, I, I, I just want you to know, and, the, and of course, the opposite side of the coin, but what's a coin made of? Disordered and amorphous materials. So now we, we, I'd like to go into the information side of the business. And I will, I think that I will quickly. Do I get anything of the Robert Bruce or Dave Bruce? Or the first one's no, I'm going to, no, I'm going to do that at the end. At the, at the the end. Yeah. So, uh, Wally, uh, uh, no, I, th I think we'll start with the, the more dramatic uh, presentation uh, with David on optical memories. Uh, the reason that I'd like to start with David is not that the uh, Wally's information isn't less dramatic, <laughs> but you'll be able to see uh, instead of charts, you'll be able to see something which has now become the, the basis of all media uh, for DVD and, uh, and other optical uh, materials, op uh, face change, optical face change materials which I invented years ago, and which is now the universal uh, me uh, media for, the, uh, for things that, like, I'd like Dave to start it. Uh, for you. Dave Strand is the head of our optical memory group. And again, if I wish I could call other people, but again, we would not have what we're doing now here without this, this young man. Thank you. And we would not have what I'm going to show you without this young man. <laughs> <laughs> and the first thing I'm going to show you is the products that Stan just mentioned. Um, these are probably dear to his heart because they have resulted from inventions that he made early on in the, uh, in the ECD career, and that is uh, phase change erasable optical discs. We have two different kinds of them uh, made by two different groups of our licensees for this technology. Um, this is a, a, a disc that has a format like the compact disc. I'm sure you all have either a hi-fi system with a CD audio or a computer with a CD-ROM in it. This is the disk that brings that technology to its highest level. It is a disk that you can store information on. 
rewrite that information just like you would on a conventional magnetic disk. Um, but we're still moving forward with the technology, and I'd like to tell you a couple of the things that we're doing. This order is okay, but you got to read the... Uh... <laughs> We're working um, to uh, advance the technology both in terms of the materials and the performance of the materials and also in terms of the production technology. I want to just mention that uh, Stan has challenged us in the optical memory just as he did the uh, team in photovoltaics to change the way the uh, basic product is manufactured from a one at a time basis to a continuous process and we're doing that now to reduce the production cost and to increase the throughput so we can address new markets. Uh, I hope that uh, in the not too distant future you'll be able to get your Time magazine on an Avonic optical disc uh, using a production technology that we can uh, manufacture it in a time efficient manner and very inexpensive. What I want to talk to now is um, the ways that we're working to advance the performance of the technology um, and these uh, examples show how we can increase the storage capacity. Uh, starting at the top with the conventional approach uses uh, um, an, a material which we can switch using a focused laser beam between an amorphous and a crystalline structure having a low and a high reflectivity to store digital information in the for excuse me, in the forms of zeros and ones. Um, the first thing that Stan has uh, asked us to do based on, on the concepts that he's put forth is instead of only having two structures to have four or many more structures where we can store both low and high and also intermediate reflectivity levels. And as you can see in the same amount of space that I've represented here, instead of storing four bits, we're now storing eight. There's other ways that we can increase the storage capacity too, and that's to use uh, different and new optical approaches. One is near field optical recording, um, changing the lens system, the way the light's delivered to the media. We can make the spot two and a half times smaller, and therefore two and a half times as many of them on the surface of an optical disc. Also, if we change the laser wavelength from the red lasers in use now to a blue laser, that also changes the size of the spot by about the same uh, factor that the near field recording does, uh, this time achieved with a new laser. The nice thing about these technologies is that you can combine them together. And this graph then shows what you can accomplish. Um, what I'm representing here is the storage capacity in gigabytes of a single disk and how that's progressing with time. What I want to point out to first is this line that's uh, very close uh, to the bottom of the scale here. That is the CD capacity that you're used to now with less than one gigabyte on a disk. The next uh, technology that's going to come onto the market is going to increase this capacity about seven times. That's DVD. That'll store video and computer information. And based upon our materials, just like the other one. Um, as we further improve those materials, um, we, can, uh, in, we will be introducing uh, products that have multi-level storage and get increases of uh, up to um, uh, 50 <coughs> gigabytes uh, in combination with the uh, near field recording. The blue lasers are being developed by uh, other companies, but we've designed our technology to be ca compatible both now and in the future. So in the combination of all these technologies, we can get up to 120 gigabytes per disk. On this scale here, I've given some examples of what this means. The compact disk gives you about 75 minutes of audio. With an HD TV disc, you can get two hours of uh, video information. That's using compression. With 15 gigabytes, you can store two hours of compressed HD TV. Of course, compression always has some losses, so you'd like to store it without compression. When we get to 50 gigabytes, you can store two hours on an HD t of HD TV information. Up here, these are applications which are mainly in our imagination now, uh, 
the, the kind of games that you can do with a CD are going to be hugely enhanced with a DVD, but with a capacity of 120 gigabytes, you could have your own full motion movie. Or perhaps a more practical application of that is that you could guide yourself through the whole human um, uh, anatomy um, you, in, in great detail using um, that kind of storage capacity. I wanted you to know about the implications. So I'm trying, you can see I'm mixing science, mixing technology, usage, and also to see what the, they say I'm ahead of my time, and that's true. And so that means the next century is ours. That's all it means. <laughs> now, now uh, you know, I should mention one thing, and I know the time is growing late, but it's very important. The, the amorphous silicon alloy revolution be, uh, began with the two people who are sitting in this uh, audience. One is Helmut Fritschi, and the other was Steve Hudgens, uh, who I hope stands up back there, uh, who, this, I, when there was an argument in scientific circles, I kept saying that if you, everybody said you're doing amorphous silicon, I said it can't be doing amorphous silicon that's a useless material. It's a, there's something else that's happening here. And, uh, and Helmut and Steve, who did the experiment where the thing exploded because there was hydrogen, orofen hydrogen, as it said, uh, we're, a, we're able to show that it truly is an alloy. And when, it's, when we knew that there was an alloy, then I said, now that's our field. So I just go in passing to show you again how human beings and how, what a small, real community it is. Uh, Helmut was, later became a chairman of the University of Chicago and uh, the Department of Physics, but he, he's much dearer than that to us. Uh, let me go on to, uh, to implications now as quickly as possible. I, I would think Wally would be the, uh, the next one. Once we got worldwide acceptance on optical memory with this Schmutz material, you know, and everybody's using it now, then we thought, why don't we go back to our electrical memories that that started a revolution. Intel got into the memory field because of uh, our device. In fact, Gordon Moore was a junior author in one of our papers. He was a founder, one of the founders of Intel. And what's so important uh, is that there's such new physics here that you, I hope you invite me back, not in 12 years from now, but sooner, and we can talk about that. But I thought that, that what you're going to hear now is equally as dramatic is the kind of weight to energy that you heard from Shabendu the kind of density that you heard uh, from David by Wally, who's in charge of our microelectronics group and who was with us since he was a mere child. <laughs> so. Thank you, Stan. Uh, I'm going to talk about the materials that Stan invented uh, a long time ago. And these materials have, over the years, evolved to be a very uh, special material. They have a very, very unique property. Uh, first of all, in their two phases, which are the extremes, the amorphous phase and the polycrystalline phase, uh, they have the properties, as Dave already mentioned, they reflect more or less light. What's very unique about these materials that Stan actually pointed out way back a long time ago was that there's a, there are intermediate states in these materials. And that is why this material is so valuable. The intermediate state not only changes uh, as Dave pointed out previously, the fact that you can store more bits, but it also changes electrically the conductivity of the material. The material itself changes over orders of magnitude in conductivity. And the area that I work in is in uh, making an electrical memory of this material. By passing current through this material, uh, one can change the resistance of this material, and one can read that out as a uh, as a device in, for a memory. And why memory? Well, I think everybody's got a computer these days, and computers love memory. And the more memory, the better. And uh, there's memory like DRAM, the dynamic, uh, dynamic random access memory. There's uh, SRAM. There's all sorts of memories. And they are uh, hundreds of uh, billions of dollars worth of uh, product. So there's a very exciting reason, besides the fact this is obviously very exciting science for us to work at. There's obviously a, a potential payback at the, at the end of this. Now, these intermediate states that I show as, as one, I show some numbers underneath here. 
the numbers underneath essentially are, are binary numbers. Let me show you what we're able to attain in the lab in this view graph. Uh, these are memory, what we call a memory device, and after we pass current through it, we measure the resistance of this device. And alongside, on the right-hand side of the graph, I don't know if you can see it, I've got binary digits. And these digits represent the states that the memory can attain. As you can see, uh, there are 16 levels corresponding to four binary bits. One can, in effect, store four bits in this one memory cell. So if we had, uh, if we were to compare, and let me take another view graph here. Just recently, I think most of you have heard of Intel, and uh, they announced recently what they call the Holy Grail. This is their memory, their flash memory, which is able to store two bits, two levels. And, I'm sorry, four levels. And the previous graph that I just showed you is the memory we're working on. We are capable of storing 16 levels. That's four bits. And they and said that was a holy grail. It was going to cause a revolution. So we said, fine, if that's a holy grail, then we know, you know, we can build a nice temple. Uh, <laughs> Square the holy grail. Some of the other features, which I haven't really mentioned about these memories, uh, memory devices that we're working on, I'll go through some of them right now, and I'll summarize them on the next chart. Uh, first of all, we're able to write many, many times to this uh, particular memory cell. Uh, we can write greater than 10 to the 13 times and without failure, and where the Intel Strataflash can only go 10,000 times before it fails. We demonstrate that by letting it, uh, ours run for one second. That's the lifetime of an Intel chi uh, chip. And then uh, you know how 10 to the 13, you go on and on and on, months and months and months. So it's a very dramatic way of showing that you have something unique and absolutely revolutionary. On the previous view graph, uh, you saw the voltage there was less than four volts, where Intel needs five volts, and they also have to have a charge pump built into the chip to build up the voltage. That's an internal power supply to get up to 12 volts so they can program it. Uh, we're able to write faster than they can. The write time is uh, 0.6 microseconds compared to their 10 microseconds. And our erase, we do not need a erase. One thing that is obvi obvious from the previous view graph is that we can directly overwrite any bit. In other words, we can program it with that current. When we apply uh, a certain current to the cell, it knows what we applied to it. We don't have to erase it first and then rewrite it. That's a very, very big feature. Saves a lot of time in processing and in communicating with the memory. Uh, then we can, uh, they have a minimum size, minimum block size they have to erase where we can do a direct overwrite and uh, we can access our device uh, faster than they can. Let me just 